and good evening. We're so happy to be learning with you here at Drisha for the start of the Ells Man. Um, this class is the Periphery of Redemption, the Torah readings of Rosh Hashanah with Rabbi Wendy Absalem. Um, as you come in, um, I will invite you to become a panelist. Uh, you can accept that if you wish, and it just means that uh, we're able to see you if you choose to put on your Zoom screen. Um, and when Rabbi Wendy invites uh, questions and comments, you can unmute to ask them yourself um, if you wish. Um, when you're not speaking, um, we just ask that you keep yourself on mute. It just minimizes background noise. So we can all hear each other. And of course, you are welcome to put your questions and your comments um, in the Zoom chat or as the Facebook comments. Um, so I'm just going to give a little introduction to this class and then to Rabbi Wendy. So how can we know what God wants of us? In Genesis 16, Sarai, Avram and Hagar all struggle to understand their role in God's covenant. Their interactions and their mistakes lay the groundwork for Genesis 21, the powerful Torah reading on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. We will do a close reading of both the biblical texts and utilize Midra rabbinic midrashim to explore each character's motivations and why the story was chosen to be read on the day of judgment. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce uh, my teacher and now our teacher, Rabbi Wendy. Um, Rabbi Wendy Amsalem teaches Talmud and Halacha at Yeshivat Drisha and directs the Beit Midrash program, a joint project of Maharat and Yeshivat Hochbe Torah. She also teaches regularly at Drisha, Pardes and the Temple Emanuel Strika Center. Rabbi Wendy received smicha from Yeshivat Maharat and is an alumna of the Drisha Stock Scholar Circle. She has a BA in history um, and literature from Harvard University. And with that, over to you. Very nice. Thank you so much. Should we wait a few minutes or do we feel like these are our people? Um, we have a few people in the waiting room that I'm just now inviting in, so they can hear you as they come in. So feel free to start. Oh, okay. Uh, why don't you tell me when you have when they are in? Because I feel like we may as well wait one more second to get everybody. Sandra, it is so nice to see you. What a treat! It's wonderful to see you too. Yeah. Delighted, delighted. You don't look a, a second older than the last time I sat in a seminar room with you. True. It was nice to sit in person. That was a good thing. Oh, that was so, I know. Those days were fabulous. Remember the Talmud narratives class? Yeah. That, I, was, that, was, that was wild. Those yeah. were great, great classes. I think of them often. Thank you. Rabbi Thank Wendy, there, there are people um, who are here. They're just, uh, they just don't want to turn on their cameras. So that's everyone who's in the waiting room who's in. Got it. So I only see three people. Is that right? Or am I just not seeing things properly? Um, plus there is eight people in the attendees. So they're here. They're just um, choosing not to be in the Zoom room so they can see you, but you can't see them. Oh, I understand. Okay, that is fine. Great. We'll get started. Uh, welcome to all the people, whether or not I see your Zoom box. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about um, about these these stories. They are uh, among my favorites, and um, I've spent some time uh, this summer thinking about them some more. Um, so we'll get started, and uh, if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to stop me. You can either put the question in the chat, but it would probably be even better to just unmute and ask the question. Although, I, I guess, Lily Nas, if somebody puts a question in the chat, maybe you'll see it. I'm not so good at looking at the chat while I'm talking. Lily Nas will help us out. Amazing. Um, Okay, so uh, the very first source over here is kind of way, way early in the story. It is way before Abram and Sarai and um, and uh, Hagar and Yishmael, way before any of them are born. This is uh, from Perikud from chapter 11 of the book of Genesis. If you remember, the beginning of chapter 11 is all about the failed attempt to build, to build Migdal Babel, the Tower of Babel. And then after that, uh, the, the text kind of launches into a series of genealogies, listing all of the descendants of Noah's son, Shem, all the way down to the birth of Abraham. So we're told that uh, Shem has a son named Arpachshad. Arpachshad lives for a while, uh, has a son named Shelach. Um, then uh, uh, Shelach has a son named Ever. Ever has a son named Peleg. Peleg has a son named Reu. Reu has a son named Sarug. And that's exactly where we've picked it up over here in our 
uh, in our text, right? We're told in, in, in verse 22, Sarug lives for 30 years. He has a son named Nahor. Then Sarug continues on uh, for a, to live 200 more years after, uh, after the birth of Nahor and has many other sons and daughters. Nahor himself lives for 29 years in verse 24. Um, he has a son named Terach. Then Nahor lives on for um, another 119 years and has many other sons and daughters. Uh, then in verse 26, we're told that Terach lives for 70 years. He has three sons, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And this is the moment where the sort of the pattern starts to break a bit. Because up until now, right, for basically for nine generations, we've been told the, the person lives X number of years, has their first child, uh, and then lives on Y number of years afterwards and has many more children. And now, and but we never were never told anybody else's name other than that first, the first child who was born. Now they were told Terach doesn't just have, right? We would expect to hear Terach lives X number of years, has a son named Avram, and then lives a whole bunch of years longer and has many other children. Um, but here we're actually told all of Terach's children, right? He has three sons, Avram, Avram rather, Nahor, and Haran. Um, uh, and then um, in verse 28, something else very unusual happens, right? We're told, So in verse 28, we're told that actually one of Terach's sons dies, right? We don't know why, the verse doesn't tell us, but Haram dies, he dies in the presence of his father, Terach, right? While his father is still alive, this is very unusual, Um in uh, in Rishi, right up until now, the only other person we've met who uh, who dies before their their father is uh, is of course Hevel, who is killed by his brother Cain. Um, but here we have uh, we're told that uh, that Terach dies. Uh, the Midrashim Rishi Rabbah spins you know a whole story out of this verse, right? Imagines it being connected to Avram and, and idolatry and so forth. But here we're just told that the verse just tells us that Haran dies. And then we're told in verse 29, Avram and Nahor get married. Um, Avram marries a woman named Sarai. Nahor marries a woman named Milka. And then we're told that Milka is the daughter of Haran. So Haran, the brother who died, sorry, we were told back in verse 27, Haran has a son named Lot. Now we know that he has a daughter named Milka who marries Nahor. And he has another child named Yiska. We don't know anything more about Yiska, but the Midrashim all say, oh, Yiska, Yiska is really just another name for Sarai. Because if Nahor marries one of Haran's daughters, marries uh, Milka, it stands to reason that Avram marries the other daughter. He must marry Sarai. So the Midrashim sort of suggests that Avram and Sarai have this uncle-niece relationship. If Sarai is really Iska, then Avraham is her uncle. That will become important later on for their claim of somehow being brothers and sisters. But here we're, you know, if we accept that Iska and, Sar and Sarai are one and the same, that would mean that Avram is her uncle, is her father, Haran's brother, uh, and she would, she would be the niece. Um, and then the most unusual verse, and the one that I wanted to draw our attention to, is verse 30, right? Pasuk Lamed. Here we're told, but he Sarai Akara in Lavalad, right? So uh, we're told Sarai is, is barren, is child, and she, she has no children, right? She's infertile, she doesn't have a child. Um, and this is really a very striking verse, right? Because it comes at the tail end of verse after verse of genealogies, right? There's a sense that um, one after the other, uh, each generation, right? The, 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 you know, the father has, has his first child, uh, then as many other children afterwards, right? It's a whole, you know, kind of continual um, uh, series of, of, of children being born in this very lovely way. And then suddenly it all comes to like a stop over here in verse 30, right? This is, you know, Sarai is the first person that we've ever heard of in the world who is unable to have a child. And I think the fact that we're told this kind of at the end of this whole sort of repetitive set of genealogies really kind of emphasizes how unusual this is, right? There's something very striking about the fact that Sarai is unable to have children. Okay, uh, Lily Naz, if you can scan us up a bit into source number two, right? Very next chapter is chapter 12, right? This is the beginning of Parsha Lech Lecha. In this chapter, we're told that God says to Avram, Lech Lecha me artzecha, mi moladetcha, mi beit avicha, ela aretz asher eka, right? Avram gets this kind of powerful command from God to go from his land and his birthplace and his father's household to the land that God will show him. 
And now in the next two verses, God offers Avram a series of promises for what will happen if he in fact follows this directive. So we're told in verse uh, in verse two, right? God says to Avram, if you go, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll become a blessing. I will... Um, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And actually all the, all the families of the earth will be blessed for you, which is quite a lovely set of promises. But the very first one, I think is the most important one for our purposes, right? The very first thing that God promises Avram, if he's willing to go, is I will make you into a great nation. Now, this is a moment of great irony, right? Because we were just told that Avram is married to the one person we've ever heard of who is unable to have children. And the first thing that God promises Avram is that he will have so many descendants that he will become a great nation. Um, so right from the start, we, we kind of, have this question of, well, how is this really going to happen, right? We have Sarai, who's unable to have children. We have Avram, who's now being promised that he'll become a great nation. How exactly is, is that going to happen? And who is this promise being directed to, right? Is this a promise just for Avram? Is it Avram will become a great nation? And one way or the other that will happen? Or is it a promise for Avram and Sarai together? And it's just not clear from the verses, right? Because God is speaking to Avram. God says to Avram, I'll make you into a great nation. We would ordinarily assume that that would involve Avram and his wife, but maybe not. Because Sarai, we've just been told beforehand, is, is unable to have children. So there's a, a kind of, <coughs> sorry, sort of deep question right at the very start of this covenantal conversation. Um, and I think the other thing to think about is how appealing this promise would be to Avram and Sarai, right? If they are the first people we've ever been told of who are unable to have children, to be told by God that if you go to this land, not only will you have a child, but you will have so many, so many descendants that you'll become a great nation, right? There's something particularly appealing about this for them, right? There's a sense that like, you know, something that 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 they want a lot that they've been unable to have will suddenly uh, kind of come to be if if they're willing to make this journey. Um, sure enough, then in uh, in verse four, we're told Avram goes the, uh, as God instructs him, and these are the people who go with him: Lot, his nephew Lot, Haran's son. Um, and uh, in verse five, we're told also Sarai, his wife, goes along with them, and also all of the property that they already own, um, and also all the souls that they had gotten in Haran. Uh, the commentaries tend to have two different ways of understanding who these souls are. The more mundane one is that, you know, they own some uh, some human uh, chattel, right? They own some some slaves, and those are the souls that they take with them as part of their property. The, the nicer Midrashic version of it is that these are the, the people that they have kind of persuaded to the worship of the one God. These are the, you know, those who they've con sort of converted to their to their beliefs, and these are the people who travel with them also. At any rate, Avram, Lot, Sarai, their property, and either slaves and or followers um, uh, join them. And uh, Lillian, as if we could scan it up a little bit more, please. Um, and they go, they go to the land of Canaan, they get there. And as soon as they get there, God appears to Avram in verse seven. And what God says to Avram is, now that you are here, I want you to know there's an additional promise. It's not just that you'll become a great nation and that you'll be blessed, but actually your descendants will inherit this land, which is again amazing because there are no descendants at all. But Avram is now being told that even though he has no descendants, these unborn, not yet formed descendants will eventually inherit the land that, that he has gotten to, which is again an amazing, an amazing promise for Avram to be given. Okay, uh, then we're told they, uh, they're there for a little while. And then suddenly in verse 10, there is a famine. Um, uh, there's a famine throughout the land of Canaan. So Avram heads down to Egypt um, to try to escape the famine. And then we're told in verse 11, as Avram gets kind of close, he's nearing the land of Egypt. He turns to his wife, Sarai, and he says a curious thing to her. He says, He says, look, 
I know that you are a beautiful woman. And here again, the commentaries uh, say, well, either he knew this all along, but right now is the moment where it kind of her beauty will, will pose a danger to him, and that's why he's bringing it up. But there's a very interesting midrash that says, well, actually, maybe he didn't really realize how unusually beautiful she was until they undertook this difficult journey in the middle of the famine to Egypt. And like, despite all of the travails of the journey, she is still beautiful. And so he's sort of aware that maybe there's something sort of unusually beautiful about her. Uh, yeah, Sandra, please. There's a wonderful midrash, didn't just want to let it pass, um, that says that it was that he had he was seeing her in the light of day, the very, very clear light of of, Egypt, of the outskirts of Egypt. And mm -hmm. he hadn't seen her uh, as brightly, in as clearly in daylight before. And that when she did her skirts to ford the river before she entered Egypt, he actually saw shoka, which is such a sexy, gorgeous word, meaning her thigh. And mm -hmm. we're struck by the fact that, hey, what? You've been married to her for 65 years and, you, and she's barren and you've never seen her thigh. And the answer is maybe not. And certainly maybe not in the light of day. And so what, what's fascinating to me, other than the interpersonal story that that tells, is that the, the, um, the Midrashim are thinking that too. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, that, that is totally true, Sanja. And the truth is, I didn't mention that Midrash because it always makes me a little sad to think that like he's never no. here. But I'm but you're right. There, that is definitely but it also tells because the story is a sex involved story, which yeah. is about to happen. I think this part of the sexiness of it needs to be told too sometimes because you got to see that she was so breathtaking that mm -hmm. King would would do this to to possess her, and yet he's only just now recognizing mm -hmm. the beauty, and right. it's. Very tough. Very right. Tough. And the truth is, and I think the Midrash wants it to be that he's only recognizing yeah. it now because if he knows it all along, it makes it kind of that much worse that he's just yes. right. If he yeah. knew all along that she was so beautiful and that he was leading her into this oh. very situation, then it becomes really difficult. But if you yeah. somehow imagine that like he either didn't know or didn't really think about it, and now suddenly he is, like it feels yeah. a little feels a little yeah. bad. The Hine na Yadati is a kind of holy moly look. I just, I just figured this out. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a nice expression. It, it sort of tries to ameliorate the, the situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think again, even he may I would say could be read either way, right? Either, either way. Um, here, here, I know this, or oh, you know, now we know. Oh, by the, oh, by the way, no, yeah. you're gorgeous. Right. Yeah. Okay, so at any rate, he, he, he says to Sarai, you are very beautiful. When the Egyptians see you, they'll say, they'll say, oh, that's his wife. And they will kill me uh, and they will keep you alive. They'll kill me in order to have you, which always feels to me a little bit funny in terms of this like assumed morality, right? Like that for the Egyptians, like murder, not a big deal, but adultery, that would be very terrible, right? And so like, there's a sense that like, they wouldn't think twice about killing Avram, but they would certainly not be willing to kind of take Sarai if Avram was alive. Somehow that that would be really problematic for them. Um, okay. So, uh, so Avram then suggests the following plan. He says, um, please say that you're my sister, right? And especially if we build on that Midrashic idea that they're kind of a little bit related in an uncle and niece way. So say, please, that you're my sister. So that things will be good for me on your account. And I will, I will, um, I will live because of you. Now, if we were to sort of think about this, um, this request that Avram is making for Sarai, right? So what does Avram get out of it? All right, why does he want to say, her to say that she's his sister? It'll save his life. Right, well, two things, right? The second thing is, uh, is it will save his life. The first thing is, things will be good for me on your account. And in a few verses, we'll see very explicitly what Avram means by things will be good for me, right? Things will be good for me on your account and also my life will be saved. If we think about what Sarai gets out of saying that she's his sister, it's not so clear, right? It could be that like, she's no worse off either way they were gonna take her perhaps. Um, but like, why should they also kill him, right? That might be one way to say it, but certainly there's no, there's no personal advantage to Sarai to saying that she's his sister, right? It certainly helps Avram out a lot to the extent that she cares about Avram. And, you know, it's also helpful to her, but she doesn't get any sort of tangible benefit out of this ruse of saying that, that she's his sister. 
Sure enough, they get to Egypt. The Egyptians see her. They see that she's very beautiful. They praise her to Paro. Um, and then in verse 16, we're told, right? Pharaoh is good to Avram on her account, using exactly that language that Avram predicted back in verse 13, right? And now we're told, right? He's good to Avram on Sarai's account. And what is the nature of this goodness? It is a tremendous transfer of wealth, right? Paro gives him sonu bakar, sheep and cattle, chamorim, donkeys, avadim mushfachot, male and female slaves, va'atonot malim. Um, female donkeys and, and that and camels, right? There is a, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of wealth, right? This kind of fits with the it, the uh, the idea that we see elsewhere in, in Sefer Breshit that uh, at this point in time, when a marriage would happen, the the uh, the groom would give the bride's family a lot of wealth, right? That's why when Avram is looking for a wife for Yitzchak later on, he sends his servant with 10 camels laden with treasure to give to the bride's family. It's why Yaakov, when he wants to marry Rachel and doesn't have wealth to offer, needs to kind of offer his own labor, right? So this is pretty standard. Avram knew to expect this, right? He knew that if he said that he was Sarai's brother, he would be given all of this wealth by Paro, and sure enough, he is. He is. Um, and then we're told in, in verse 17, uh, God smites Pharaoh with these terrible plagues because of Sarai. Uh, Avram then summon, sorry, uh, Avram is summoned by Paro. Paro says to him, Mazot Asitali, what have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say that she was your sister? But look, she really is your wife. Take her and go. And not only does Paro send him out, but Paro kind of sends along men to sort of escort him on his way, right? He really wants to make sure that they get out of, out of this country, right? So they sent him and uh, Avram and his wife and also all that he had. And I think that that moment is really important because it means that Paro doesn't take the wealth back, right? Even though he gave Avram all of this wealth kind of predicated on the fact that he was supposed to be marrying Avram's sister. Once he sends them off, he doesn't take the wealth back, right? The things that they've been given, um, in fact, um, they get to keep. And sure enough, in the in the next chapter, we're told that uh, Avram and Lot have so much wealth from their sojourn in Egypt that eventually they actually have to part ways because there's not enough um, pasture for all the animals that they've been given, right? So they get to keep whatever they were given in Egypt. Now, I wanted us to have that story in mind when we get to the first verse of chapter 16, um, right? So we're skipping a couple of chapters, now getting closer to the story that we're, we're really going to focus on. Here we're told, Sarai eshet Avram lo yotav, right? Sarai, Avram's wife, right? Now we're several chapters later. Turns out, we'll find out in a moment, they were 10 years later, 10 years have gone by. Sarai still hasn't had any children. Now, remember, Avram was promised that if he went to the land that God would show him, uh, he was going to become a great nation. And now Avram's gotten to that land. He's been there for 10 years. And uh, Sarai still doesn't have a child. And we're told almost as a non sequitur, um, Sarai doesn't have any children, but she does have a maidservant. The maidservant is Egyptian, and her name is Hagar. Now, I think when we find out that the maidservant is Egyptian, it it seems extremely likely that the point at which Hagar joined their household was um, as part of this story that we saw in chapter 12, right? Remember, Paro had given Avram this, you know, all of his wealth, including male and female slaves. Turns out now that Sarai has this female slave, this handmaid, who is Egyptian. Um, and most likely she was sort of part of this transfer of wealth that, that, that Paro gave to, uh, to Avram. Um, there are Midrashim that suggest that maybe Hagar herself really was of royal lineage when she saw Avram and Sarai, even though she was, you know, connected or a daughter of Paro, she said, oh, I'd rather be a maidservant in their house than a queen here, and so she joins them, you know, in that way, but either way, um, she's Egyptian and, uh, and she's joined them while they were, while they were in Egypt, and I think that that's important for us because it means that Hagar knows what has happened in Egypt, right? She knows the story, right? She knows that when Avram and Sarah were in, when Avram, Avram and Sarai, sorry, her name eventually becomes Sarah, but it's still Sarai. When Avram and Sarai were in Egypt, Avram was willing to sacrifice Sarai's safety, and probably sacrifice her dignity um, for himself, right? Avram wanted to be safe and he wanted this wealth and he was willing to 
put Sarai in a position um, uh, that was not something that presumably Sarai wanted in order to kind of have things be good for himself. And I think that um, because Hagar is specifically identified as the Egyptian maidservant, I think we're, we're meant to sort of read chapter 16 with chapter 12 in our minds, right? With that story of the, the two of them in, in Egypt. Um, and I often kind of think, you know, like when, when Avram and Sarai leave Egypt, right? So they're okay, right? You know, Presumably Sarai has been, I mean, the verse doesn't tell us, the Midrashim make it very explicit that Sarai is protected from Paro's advances, even though the verses don't, don't make that explicit. They do later on with Avima, but here they don't make it explicit. Um, so, but even if, even if let's say she emerges kind of physically unscathed from, from Paro's household, I kind of wonder like, what does she think about her marriage afterwards, right? What does she think about Avram? What does it mean to know that your, your, your partner and your husband is kind of willing to sacrifice your safety for, their, for their, own, their own benefit and their own safety, right? There's something about that that feels kind of heavy and, and, and difficult. I, I imagine it's kind of another, another layer in, in their relationship. And, and Hagar, as the Egyptian maidservant, kind of knows, knows this about their marriage as well, right? Knows that when it comes down to it, Avram is willing to kind of sacrifice, sacrifice Sarai. Um, okay, that is all, you know, we, we, we can sort of infer all of that just from verse one. Then in verse two, we're told, Vatomer Sarai el Avram, he na at Sarani Hashem Uvede. Right, Sarai turns to Avram and she says, behold, God has prevented me from having a child. Bo na el shifchati ulai banem imena. Um, please come to my maidservant, perhaps I will be built up from her. And uh, Avram listens to Sarai. So several things about this verse, I think, are noteworthy, right? One is, it's interesting that Sarai assumes that God is preventing her from having a child, right? You know, we know that at the end of chapter 11, we're told, but to he Sarai, Akara, that Sarai is childless. But presumably at this point in time, neither Avram nor Sarai have any children. So why is Sarai so convinced that God is preventing her from having a child? So I'm curious for the people who are in our Zoom, what do you guys think, right? Why does she think that God is preventing her from having a child as opposed to Abraham? Um, this is Randy. I, I think there's a traditional feeling in um, patriarchal societies that if um, somebody was barren, it was the woman's fault and that uh, probably has continued on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. great. It could just be that the assumption was that it was always the woman's, uh, the woman's biological kind of uh, disability, or it was the woman's sort of, you know, the, the infertility was coming from the woman's side, right? And this is just another example of that, right? That could totally be. Yeah, Sandra, what do you think? Okay, so um, if, if we look at the Midrashim again, and just go back to the formative chapter 12, where she's taken... Um, uh, by the Pharaoh into his harem and who knows what uh, tortures and, and, and other things that she endured. Um, the Midrash is very strong about the fact that an angel of God, not Abraham, came mm -hmm. to her aid. Mm -hmm. And would it be something like you just suggested that she's ruminating about and thinking about that it wasn't Abraham who saved me. In fact, he put me in the, in the, in the, into the fire, so to speak, to use the image there for Abraham, but um, that he put me into the fire and it, it was the deity, the, the, the one God, the one God that we've, been, that we've been gathering for all these years, it was he who saved me, not my husband. And, if, and, and the Midrash, you pick up on this so strongly to the point that they even actually say that she saw when she, when she was on the verge of being raped by Pharaoh and he's right there in, you know, in flagrante. And uh, one angel just steps between them and says, do not touch her one finger on this flesh and you're a dead man. That Midrash is so stark. They're putting this image into Sarah's brain. And of course it sticks in, in the reader's brains too. So I think that, that at least I think that the Midrashim, uh, Aviva Zornberg often says that the Midrash speaks in the voice of the woman. It's possible that the Midrash was telling us something, putting us into Sarai's head, that maybe she was seeing the angel. It was she who believes that the deity saved her, that she was forever scarred by the fact that her husband did not 
In fact, he put her there. So that's why I think that all this follows, that mm -hmm. she's, um, it's God who made me uh, infertile because it's God who, who's doing all, his, his finger is in all the other pies. Uh, okay, so, so you're saying that, the, the, that Sarai had this very kind of personal experience of God, and so she's sort of more aware of God's presence everywhere. Um, yeah, in terms of the Midrash that you're, that you're citing, I mean, one of the interesting things about it, if you remember, um, back in chapter 12, the actual language is that um, right? because of the matter of Sarai, and but it could Bar, is Sarai is being at Sarai's command, right? That Sarai yeah, exactly. has like smite him. And, and I think right. the way of the Midrash also sort of making it clear that Sarai doesn't want to be with Pharaoh. There's nothing compelling about the king. You know, she's the person who decides she doesn't want to, and then the angel kind of helps save her. But I like that. I like that idea very much, Sandra, that, that Sarai is sort of attuned to God's hand in it. But I think it could be God's hand preventing Avram from having a child also. But she's but she's assuming that God is preventing her, right? She says, Sarani. Right, God is stopping me from having a child, and it could be, as Randy suggested, that it's that was just the general assumption. I think it could also be, though, that as I was saying in the beginning, right, the the question from the very beginning of the covenantal conversation is: Is this covenant just with Avram, or is it with Avram and Sarai? And it could be that Sarai says, "Well, you know, I was hoping that it was both of us, but if we haven't had a child yet, and Avram is the one who was promised by God that he'll become a great nation, it must be that like I'm the one who's kind of." holding up this becoming of the great nation, right? Because Avram is clearly going to become a great nation. The only open question is whether Sarai is a part of it. So she says, God is preventing me from having a child. But Sarai is not, not saying God is preventing me from having a child. I'm not a part of the covenant, but I don't want to hold you back, Avram. I want to make sure you have a child. Here's a surrogate. She's definitely not saying that, right? What she says is, come to my maidservant, right? Maybe I will be built up from her. And that's how we know that what Sarai is doing is not just offering Avram the opportunity to have a child. What she's saying is, I want both of us to have a child. My plan is to use my maidservant as a surrogate, and perhaps I can then be built up for, through her, right? The assumption seems to be that Hagar will give birth to the child, but Sarai will sort of raise the child and kind of sort of, it will be as if it is Sarai's time. Now, in case we think that this seems like too much of a crazy plan, right, it does, it is the case later on in Breshit that when Rachel is unable to have a child, she gives her maidservant to Bilha, uh, sorry, she gives her maidservant Bilha to Yaakov. Yaakov has two children with her, and it doesn't seem like there's an undue amount of drama there. It seems like that was kind of a standard thing that would have that, that could happen. And Sarai is sort of assuming that this is, you know, this is a plan, right? She would have preferred to have her own child, but having waited 10 more years in Canaan, seeing that she's not having a child, she says, well, God has prevented me from having a child, but maybe I can think of a workaround, right? If God is not allowing me to conceive, that doesn't mean that I'm not a part of this covenant. It just means that maybe I need to sort of get you in a different way. Um, why don't you try to have a child with my maidservant and perhaps I can then be built up through my maidservant, meaning I will, I will sort of, you know, mother this child that will be born. And we're told, and this is also really important, Avram listens to Sarai. He's willing to do what she suggests. I think that moment is important because it tells us that Avram hasn't been planning on his own to have a child in some other manner, right? He hasn't been looking to sort of marry another wife have a concubine, maybe divorce Sarai, right? He's not, right, he was willing to sort of wait, right? It's he, you know, he's married to Sarai. He's willing to sort of wait one way or the other for God to sort of give them a child. But when Sarai suggests this, he's willing to go along with it, right? He doesn't say, no, no, it must be a child with you. But but it also isn't his, it isn't his plan. It's really Sarai's plan. Then in verse three, we're told, uh, Sarai takes Hagar, the Egyptian, her maidservant, after 10 years of Avram and Sarai living in Canaan, she gives her to Avram, her husband, as a wife. So several things are noteworthy about, about verse three. One is that all of the action verbs are Sarai's, right? Sarai is the one who takes uh, Hagar. She's the one who gives Hagar to Avram, right? It's not just her plan. It seems like it's totally her 
um, execution of the plan, right? She's the person arranging all of it. Um, Avram's willing to go along with it, but but it's really Sarai's, Sarai's plan. Um, the other thing that's interesting to notice is that she gives Hagar to Avram as a wife. And this is part of a story that is very unclear because if we only had verse three, we would assume that Hagar's status is as a wife. But in two or three verses down from here, we're going to see that actually Avram thinks of her still as a maid, and so does so does Sarah. And so it's not it's not super clear exactly what Hagar's status is, right? In one verse she's described as a wife. Shortly afterwards, she'll be described as a slave again. So it's it's not 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 totally clear. Um, Okay. Uh, at any rate, though, Hagar, and, and of course, we have to say that Hagar doesn't seem to be consulted about any of this, right? We don't know if this is something that she wanted. We don't know if this was forced upon her, right? The verses don't mention any, um, uh, you know, disagreement on her part, but it's unclear whether she had any choice, you know, whether she could have disagreed if she wanted to. Um, okay. Then we get to verse four. We're told, Bayavoa Hagar Vatahar right? In four words, right, Hagar becomes pregnant, right? It almost seems like, you know, we don't even get to the end of the verse and she's, right, she's already pregnant. Um, Avram and Sarai have been trying to have a child for years and years and years with no success at all. And then it seems like Avram is with Hagar and sort of instantly Hagar conceives. And then we're told in verse four, vatera ki harata vatikal virta beina. As soon as Hagar sees that she is pregnant, her mistress becomes lighter in her eyes. In other words, she begins to dis disrespect Sarai. In verse five, Sarai turns to Avram and she says to him, Chamasi alecha. She says to him, Avram, my wrong is upon you. Anochi natati shifchati bechakecha. I took my maidservant and gave her into your bosom. Vatereki harata. As soon as she saw that she conceived, I became lighter in her eyes. God judge between us. Now, this verse is also very odd, right? Sarai seems to be saying to Avram, I'm so angry at you, right? My wrong is upon you. I gave you Hagar, you know, I gave you my maidservant. And now my maidservant is really disrespecting me. May God judge between us, right? Avram, this is all your fault. And there's something about this that seems very odd, right? We would understand Sarai being angry at Hagar if Hagar is disrespecting her. But the fact that Sarai is kind of pouring her anger out on a woman who really is kind of just doing what Sarai told him to seems very unusual. Now, in order to understand what, what Sarai is saying over here, um, uh, Lily Ness, can you help us scan down please to verse to source number five? So we have to, thank you so much. Okay, so we have to kind of take a pause over here and go back one chapter, right? We're in chapter 16 over here with the story of, of Hagar and, uh, and Sarai, but back in chapter 15, we had a, a different important encounter between God and, uh, and Avram, right? We're told over here, right? God appeared to Avram in a vision and God says to Avram, Altira Avram anochim magen mod. Don't worry, Avram. I will shield you. Your reward will be very great. This is after um, uh, Avram kind of interferes in the world war of his time, the war of the four kings against the five kings. Avram helps defeat um, defeat the four kings, and he's able to save uh, the city of Sodom and his nephew Lod and all of his family property. Um, after all of that, God says, don't worry, Avram, don't worry that these other kings are going to come after you. I am going to protect you, and your reward will be very great. And it seems like Avram has been very patient up until now. He's been told that he's going to become a great nation. He's been told that the land will be given to his descendants who don't yet exist. But Avram seems to start to get worried over here. And so Avram says to God, Hashem Elohim matiteni, right? You're telling me that you're going to give me a great reward, but what really can you give me? Given that I... Am childless, uven meshek beti who damesek Eliezer, and the the uh, possessor of my house, the one who's going to inherit me, is Eliezer of Damascus, my my servant. Right, I don't have any children. I only have this servant. I understand that you're promising me this great reward, and you've promised me that I'll become a great nation. You've promised me this land, but what actually can you give me, given that I don't have any children? Um, so Avram, Avram makes this request to God. God doesn't respond. And so in verse three, Avram decides to be a little more explicit. He doesn't just say, what can you give me given that I'm childless? Avram now in verse three says, Avram says, God, 
you have not given me any children, right? right? The servant of my household is going to is going to inherit me, right? You haven't, you, you're promising me these very grandiose things, but like, how is that going to happen if I don't have a single child, right? I, I don't have any children at all. You, God, have not given me a child. So now in verse four, God responds and says, no, no, you do not worry. Eliezer of Damascus is not going to be your heir. Right? A child from your own body will, will inherit you. Uh, and then in verse five, God brings Avram outside, says, look up at the sky, try to count all the stars. Uh, and your, you know, your, your descendants will be as many as the stars. And uh, in verse six, we're told um, Avram believed in God and it was sort of counted to him as righteous, right? Either means that God, uh, God counts Avram's belief as righteousness or that Avraham believes that God is doing this as a sign of God's righteousness. Either way, Avram has made the specific request of, hey, you haven't given me a child. And God has kind of explicitly promised Avram that not only will he become a great nation and will his descendants inherit the land, but his descendants will come, come from his own body. Right? So we have that kind of one story as, as a background. And now, Lilian, as if you can scan up to source number four, we'll see the Midrash. Now, this now the, this is the Midrash in Breshit Rabbah. We'll sort of take this story from, from chapter 15 and use it to explain why it is that Sarai is so angry at Ephraim, right? Remember, she said to him, lecha, my wrong is upon you. I gave you my maidservant into, into your bosom. And as soon as she became pregnant, she began to disrespect me. Uh, may God judge between us. And the Midrash over here offers two different opinions, right? The first one we're told is um, Rabbi Yudan b'shem Rabbi Yuda, right? Rabbi Yudan in the same of Rabbi Yuda said, you wrong me with words. Lama? Why or how? Shata shumea bizioni bishotik. Right, the reason why you are wronging me, the reason why chamasi alecha, right, my wrong is upon you, is that you hear how Hagar is treating me, you hear her disrespecting me, and you are silent. Right, so basically, what Sarai is saying to Avram is, you should really be defending me. And this kind of gets back to Sandra's point from before, right? Not only has Avram not defended Sarai from Paro, but he's also not defending Sarai from Hagar. You hear what's going on, Avram, and you really, you should have stepped in. And, and you didn't, and that's why that's why this is your fault. Um, Rabbi Silber actually has a, a slight variation on this that I like very much. He often says that the reason why Sarai is so angry at Avram is that what she's saying to Avram is, the way that Hagar treats me is a reflection of the way that you think about me. If Hagar knew that, you know, if Hagar thought that you respected me more, she wouldn't dare to treat me in this way, but she can tell that you don't really respect me and that's why she's also disrespecting me and that's why Sarai says it's really all your fault Avram and I think that kind of fits with the suggestion that I made right if, if Hagar joins the family joins the household in Egypt as part of this experience where Avram was willing to sacrifice Sarai for his own benefit it would make sense then that what Sarai is saying is Hagar knows that you don't really value me if you really valued me maybe you wouldn't have done that and you certainly would be defending me now and Hagar sees that you don't, and that's why she dares, dares to disrespect you. So that's kind of suggestion number one of the Midrash. Suggestion number two is a little, a little more involved. We're told over here now in the third line, Rabbi Berechia b'shem Rabbi Abba. Rabbi Berechia said in the name of Rabbi Abba, yib dini gabach, right? I ask for judgment against you. And now tells the following parable to explain what, why is Sarai asking for judgment against Avram? It's like a parable of two prisoners, two men who were imprisoned in, in a jail. The king passes by. One of the prisoners calls out and says, right, please execute judgment for me, right? Let me out of this prison. Amar Afikute. So the, the king says, Oh, yes, let this guy out of jail, right? He just asked me to let him out, let him out of jail. Amar right? So now the fellow prisoner who had been in the cell with him says, Yib right? I have uh, I have a I ask for judgment against you. Why? Ilu Amarta If you had said, execute judgment for us, for both of us. Right, the same way that you were let out of prison, I would also be let out of prison. But once you only said, execute judgment for me, 
l'cha apik, you were let out, v'li lo apik, and I was not let out. Right, that's the parable, right? So the two prisoners are there together. One of them asks to be let out of prison, but only asks for himself. And the other one said, if you had been thinking about me when you made the request, we could have both been free. But because you were only asked for yourself, you only thought about yourself, now you get to be free and I'm still here in jail. Okay, that's the parable. Then the Midrash says, Kach, right? Sarai is basically saying to Avram, Kach ilo amarta, when you were speaking to God, if you had said, anu we are infertile, right? If you had said, Hashem elokim matitein li anu arivim, holchim anu arivim, right? We are infertile. Kimadi yahav lach ben, uh, sorry, kimadi yahav lach, kein yahav li. In the same way that God is giving you a child, God could have also given me a child. But because you said, I am infertile, not we are infertile, you were given a child, I was not given a child, right? So the Midrash is saying, maybe what Sarai is really complaining to Avram about isn't actually about, isn't really connected specifically to Agar's treatment of her. What Sarai is saying to Avram is, you don't think about me right? You had this opportunity to ask for a child, and you only asked for a child for yourself. And because you had this opportunity to ask for a child, and you only asked for a child for yourself, you are now going to have a child, and I am not. And it's really your fault, Avram, because it could have just as easily been both of us if only you had said, Hochim anu ari, right? we are both infertile. Then in the same way that God gave you a child, God, God could also be giving me a child. I think it's also very interesting that the Midrash imagines that Sarai feels about her infertility as if she's in prison, right? The image is that, you know, the two prisoners, right, she and Avram are together in like the prison of their, their infertility. And now Avram has somehow been let out and she has not been let out. And she's really angry that he, he doesn't think about her. And I think this idea of Avram as sort of not really thinking about Sarai it also is kind of has its foundation in chapter 12, right? Avram was thinking about himself. He was worried about the danger to himself if he went into Egypt with a beautiful wife. He doesn't seem to be concerned about the danger to Sarai. He's also interested in the wealth that he will accrue by Sarai being taken, but it's not clear what will happen to Sarai, right? When, when you know, when, when she is taken, whether they'll ever be together again. And so I think here as well, Sarai is saying, Avram, you're, you're only thinking about yourself, right? If you thought about me, you wouldn't make the choices that you're making, but you're only thinking about yourself. Um, and that's why kind of in this moment right now, you are going to be able to have a child and, and I am not. Um, okay, well, guys, if we can go back into source three now, where we left off. So we're, we were at source three, verse um, verse five, right? Remember, thank you so much, right? Verse five is where Sarai said to Avram, my wrong is upon you. I gave you my maidservant and now she's disrespecting me. May God judge between us. Um, and it seems that like what, what Sarai is hoping for is for Avram to sort of step in and come and defend her, right? Either say to her, no, no, you know, you really are, you know, I imagine that Sarai is feeling pretty vulnerable right now, right? Her maid servant is pregnant immediately after Sarai has been trying for so long to have a child. So she might either want some sort of affirmation from Avram that, you know, she is still kind of his, his, his partner, or she might want Avram to say, I'll talk to, to Hagar and make sure she doesn't treat you this way. But Avram doesn't say that, right? Instead, what he says to her in verse six is, Hine shifchatech biadech. All right, fine. She's your, she's your maidservant. She's under your control. Asila do Do whatever you want to her. Um, which is a really terrible thing for Avram to say, right? It's terrible mostly because Hagar is a woman who he's in a relationship with, who's pregnant with his child, right? And to say to somebody else, oh, do whatever you want to her, feels like a terrible abdication of, of his responsibility to Hagar. Um, and it's also not helpful to Sarai, right? Sarai doesn't want to hear this. This, is, this isn't what she's looking for. She's not looking for, you know, oh, do whatever you want. She wants Avram to sort of either affirm her status or be willing to kind of intervene. Um, and instead, Avram's just like, yeah, do whatever you want. So, uh, so, and now in another very sad moment, right, we're told, um, Sarai, Sarai then torments or oppresses, however you want to understand, um, mistreats Hagar and mistreats her so badly that Hagar flees, right? We're told she runs away. In verse seven, we're told, the angel of God finds Hagar um, by this fountain in the wilderness on the way to Shur. And in verse eight, the angel of God says, 
Hagar Shivcha Sarai, right? Interesting that that's how he, the angel addresses her, right? Hagar, maidservant of Sarai. Amy Zabat Anatelechi. Where are you coming from and where are you going? Now, usually in, in the Torah, when either God or an angel asks a question, it's not because they don't know the answer, right? When God says to, to Adam, um, Ayeka, where are you? It's not because God doesn't know where, where Adam is, right? And when God says to Cain, e hevel achicha, where's your brother Hevel? It's not that God doesn't know that Cain has killed Hevel and you know, hid it in his body and in the ground. Um, and so here also the angel knows exactly where Hagar is coming from. But I think the, the point each time when either God or the angels ask questions is to kind of enable the person to reflect on what they're doing. Adam, what have you done such that now like you are hiding from me in the Garden of Eden? Or Cain, what have you done to your brother? And here, Hagar, what's your plan, right? You're this pregnant woman alone in the wilderness. Where are you coming from and where are you going, right? What is your plan? And Hagar responds by saying, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai, which I think is Hagar's way of saying, I don't have a plan, right? All I know is where I'm coming from. I'm coming from my mistress Sarai who is mistreating me and I'm running away and I don't know where I'm going. I just know that where I was was so terrible, but I don't have a plan at all. Um, and now the angel of God makes sort of three different offers to Hagar, right? Offer number one in verse nine is, Bayomer la malach Hashem, shuvi yad birtiach bitani tachajadah, right? Offer number one is, the angel of God says to Hagar, go back to your mistress and continue to be abused by her. Not surprisingly, Hagar does not like this option, right? So she doesn't say anything. So then the angel of God starts up again and says, Bayomer la malach Hashem, okay, let me make you a different offer. The angel of God says to her, Harba arbed zarech b'lo yisafer miro. I will give you so many descendants that they will not be able to be counted because there will be so many. Already a slightly better option, but not good enough for Hagar. She still doesn't say anything. So the angel of God has to start talking again in the next verse and make her a third offer. The angel of God says, look, you are pregnant. You will give birth to a baby. The Yishmael, And you'll name the baby Yishmael because God has heard your affliction. This child will become a, a wild, a wild man. His hand will be in everybody's stuff. Everybody else's hands will be in him. And uh, he will dwell with, with all of his brethren. Um, and then finally, Hagar starts to speak, right? Something about what this angel has offered her the third time around is compelling to her, right? And so in verse 13, um, we're told, she, she calls the name of the God who is speaking to her. You are the God who sees me. Because she says, have I even seen here after seeing? Right now, there's an interesting play here on seeing and hearing, right? We're told that the angel says to her, you'll name your child Yishmael because God has heard your suffering, has heard your affliction. And she says, God has seen me. Right. And it seems like if I had to guess, like that's the part of what the angel is saying to her that is compelling to her. Right. What God, the angel is saying to her is God sees what's going on. God sees your suffering. God is with you. Right. Not just go back and suffer, not just some sort of future promise of many generations. But right now you're not alone. God, God hears your suffering. God sees you. And um, and uh, and you're going to have this child who will kind of be powerful. Right. Will be this kind of wild wild man who will have, you know, live in the company of, of his brothers. Um, and uh, then we're told in verse 14, right, she then calls the well, Be'er Lachai Roi, uh, the place where this encounter happens with the angel, she calls the, the well of Lachai Roi, and it is between Kadesh and Barad. Um, uh, that location also will be significant later on in, in Breshid. Um, and now in, in, uh, in verse 15, we're told, uh, Hagar gives birth to a child. Um, and Vayikra Avram Shem Benoashel Yelda Hagar Yishmael. Um, Avram names the son Yishmael. Um, and the last verse over here is Avram is 86 years old when, um, when Yishmael is born. Um, and uh, and that, that is the end of our chapter. Now, several things I think are very interesting about these last two verses, right? One, one thing is that we don't know how long Hagar was gone for, right? She could have been gone for several days, but she could have also been gone for like an hour, right? She could have, she ran away because the abuse was so terrible. She gets to the wilderness. She has this conversation with the angel. 
and she's persuaded to go back. And it could be that from Avram and Sarai's perspective, they don't even know that she's been gone, right? She was away for such a short amount of time. It could be they don't even know about it, right? So we, the readers, know that, that Hagar has had this powerful encounter with, with the angel. Um, but it could be that Avram and, and Sarai don't know about that at all. Um, and in that case, when Avram names Yishmael Yishmael, he's not naming the boy Yishmael because he knows that God has heard Hagar's suffering, right? It could be that Avram names the boy Yishmael because God has heard Avram. Avram says, I said to God, hey, Lilo la tata zara, you haven't given me a child. My, my servant is going to uh, you know, inherit me. This is so terrible. And then God listened to me and God gave me a child from my own body, exactly as God promised. And it could be that from Avram's perspective, the baby, he named the baby Ishmael because God has heard Avraham's request. Um, and we, the readers, kind of are privy to this extra information that actually um, the reason why the baby is called Ishmael isn't really about Avraham, it's really about Hagar and her suffering and God hearing Hagar's suffering. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that Hagar comes back and tells Avraham what happened, and that's why he names the baby Ishmael, or maybe God tells Avraham about it, right? We just don't know. The story doesn't make it clear kind of who knows what at, 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 at this point in time. And I think it kind of puts us in this sort of very interesting, almost holding pattern for uh, for the next chapter that we're gonna look at um, next week, which is the actual Torah reading for the first day of Rosh Hashanah, right? This is kind of the foundation of it. We have this baby who's just been born, who's a very significant child in, in all three people's lives, right? In Sarah's life, in Hagar's life, in Avram's life, right? The, the birth of this baby is something that um, that Avram has certainly been been longing for, right? We know that at first he was kind of just willing to accept God's promises, but eventually he he says to God, like, hey, how can you keep promising me all these things if I don't have any children? And then God gives him this assurance that he'll have a child from his own body. And then in the next chapter, he does. Um, we know that Sarai had been hoping that this child would also be her child, right? She had phrased it not as, I want to give you the opportunity to have a child here, have a child with my maidservant. Instead, what she said was, perhaps I will be built up kind of through my, um, you know, through my maidservant, I'll be able to sort of have a child in that manner and be, be a part of this covenant. And it seems like once the relationship between Hagar and Sarai deteriorates, Sarai kind of stops holding out that hope right now she really just sees this as Avram's child not her child and I think you know she becomes um she accepts it because she you know thinks that she doesn't have any other options right certainly after the story we never hear about her trying to have a baby kind of through a different surrogate right it seems like at this you know from this moment on she kind of decides that God does not in fact want her to be a part or doesn't want her to be the, the ancestor of this covenantal people. Um, she doesn't, does, you know, in fact, later on when she's told that she'll have a child, she, she's very, very surprised about that. It seems like she, by the end of the story, has given up hope of, about it. And we know that Hagar has had this kind of very intense divine experience that it's possible nobody else even knows about, right? She has kind of a prophecy about her child. She knows something about how the events will unfold, and it's not clear whether, uh, whether, and in fact, it seems, actually, we'll see next week, likely that Avram doesn't know about that. Um, um, okay, so I see that it is 7.59. I want to leave one minute in case anybody has any questions or comments. Um, and then just to give us a sense of, well, let's first see if anybody's questions or comments, then I'll talk for a minute about what we'll do next week. Um, Lily Ness, did any questions come up in the chat that we should be addressing? Um, no, not quite. Okay, great. Um, okay, so what I want to do next week is look at chapter 21, which is the actual um, Torah reading for, um, for Rosh Hashanah. Um, and we're going to see some midrashim about Avram and, uh, and his continued relationship with Ishmael. And then we're also going to look at some um, Islamic texts that sort of tell a different story about the, the relationship between Avram and Ishmael and kind of think about sort of what do both traditions kind of, what, what aspect of the relationship are they trying to emphasize? And, um, and then we'll also talk about, you know, why, why was this the primary reading uh, for Rosh Hashanah, right? The Gemara in, in Masechet Megillah says that originally when Rosh Hashanah was only one day, this was the Torah reading, chapter 21, the story of the 
uh, of the sending of, you know, the birth of Yitzchak and the sending of Yishmael, that was the Torah reading for Rosh Hashanah. When Rosh Hashanah became a two-day holiday, we added in a second Torah reading, chapter 22, which is the story of the binding of Isaac, but that's not the primary reading. The primary reading is the, the birth of Yitzchak and, um, and the sending away of Yishmael, and I think it will be um, we'll, you know, sort of see all these different texts as a way of sort of thinking about why, why would this be chosen as, as the primary reading? Okay, um, I, I think everybody, Lily Mouse, everybody had access to the source sheet, right? I think that, I yes. think that. Yeah. So my email address is on the source sheet. If you have any sort of thoughts over the week or any questions, please email me. I would love to get to get some feedback and I can certainly incorporate any questions into our class next week. It's been a total pleasure learning with you, Lily Nels. Thank you for being such an excellent moderator. Um, and have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much, Rabba, Wendy, and thank you, um, everybody, especially the people who participated with their thoughts and their questions. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you all back here next week. I just want to let you know about some other excellent Jerisha classes happening this Elsman later tonight at 8.30 please, Eastern. Please join us for Rabbi Alex Ozar's class on Rav Hutna. If you're interested in more classes about the tefillah of Yomim Noraim, you may enjoy Rabbi Victoria Sutton's upcoming class on Piyut, um, meeting on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern. And we have many, many more classes that you can um, look at and sign up for at 5783.drisha.org slash So. Thank you.